Okay, so we're looking at our good friend, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. Wrote a lot of stuff, did some things, died, still is today. So last time we're looking at his distinction between truths of reason and truths of fact. And this is a distinction that runs through most of the philosophers of this time period, and it's still accepted by many, or at least some, today. And as we saw with truths of reasoning, they're based on those two key principles. Principle of contradiction, which in you know, logic is a principle that if, if something is a contradiction, it's impossible for it to be true. So a denial of a contradiction is always true. There's also the principle of identity, which is that each thing is what it is. And so to deny an identical proposition is to engage in a contradiction. Uh, for example, if we say that a square has four sides, we know that's a truth of, of reason because a square is a four-sided figure. So to say that a square is not a side, four-sided figure is tantamount to saying a square is not a square, which is a contradiction, or like a real something. There are also truths of fact, and these are ones that don't reduce down to identical propositions, and so you can deny them without contradiction. So if we were to say that the um, Panthers won the Super Bowl, or we say the Panthers didn't win the Super Bowl, the, the winning or losing the Super Bowl was the truth of fact. We can't, we can't take a claim like the Red Sox won the Super Bowl and reduce that down to a, you know, a, truth, of, a truth of reason. Especially since Red Sox are baseball, but maybe they'll change the rules. Now, this leads to two types of truths, the necessary truths and contingent truths. Now, these are interesting philosophically, etc., because necessary truths, again, are truths that got to be true. They cannot possibly be false. And, you know, one of the main sort of objectives of a lot of these dead guys, before they were dead, you no know, zombie philosophies is to find, you know, the method of certainty. And necessary truths are not only true, they got to be true. And so if we can find some necessary truths, they can give us the foundation for all the rest of the truths. Now, getting back to the sort of main point, a truth that's necessary is one that is true and always true. It is impossible for it to be false. And if we can find necessary truths, they'd be pretty good truths. Now, truths of reason are necessary truths. They're based on logical laws and must be true. Truths of fact, though, are contingent. And contingent means that it's something that, well, this context could be true, but doesn't have to be. So it's necessary that squares have four sides, but it's not necessary that the Panthers lost the Super Bowl. In theory, as far as you know, they could have won. Now, the truths of fact are contingent, and there are also truths about how the world happens to be. If the world had been different, these truths of fact would be untrue. I mean, use an example of the Super Bowl. If the Panthers had panthered harder, <laughs> and the Broncos had bronc less, then the Panthers could have won the Super Bowl. So I think that's a contingent truth. So the people who, you know, Bet for the Panthers can say to themselves, I could have won, maybe. Now, since we looked at our good dead friend Spinoza, Spinoza thought there are only necessary truths. So, in Spinoza's view, all truths are necessary truths. So, the Panthers losing the Super Bowl would be a necessary truth. They couldn't have won, they must have lost. I guess, which could be, given his view, uh, a way that people can escape the, the bondage of emotion, knowing that. Things couldn't be otherwise. So those poor Panther pan fans could say to themselves, it could have been otherwise. There's nothing we can do to ease their sadness, to dry the tears falling to their nachos. Now, Spinoza, of course, as we saw, believed the world happened by necessity. Everything that is has to be, couldn't be otherwise. No 
no freedom, no choice, no chance. It just is what it is. There's nothing you can do. It's review. Now, Leibniz, though, seems to accept that the world is got contingent stuff. Things could be different. The Panthers perhaps could have won. God could have created a different world. Because for Leibniz, you know, in terms of God, he does subscribe to the more classic view. You know, he believes in God. God creates a world that is not God. And he, Leibniz thinks that God could have created the world in any number of possible ways. But he starts getting a little Spinoza-like, which could be dangerous. And he says something like this. He claims that always, in every true or firm proposition, whether necessary or contingent, universal or particular, the notion of the predicate is in some way included in that of the subject. Now, to set the stage for that a little bit, the English language, like many languages, has a subject, predicate, subject. You got subject, predicate. So we attribute to the subject particular predicate. So if we say, for example, the cat is in the hat, we're attributing to the subject cat some hatness, wearing the hat. Or if we say that you know the bronco is one, we're attributing to the subject bronco's wind. Or whatever, we say like the, the marker is expo. <laughs> We're attributing to the marker the quality of expo. Now, Bondits makes this, this claim. He says the notion of the predicate is somehow included in that of the subject. Now, why is this Spinoza like? Well, in one respect, we might say this makes some kind of sense. For example, if we say that a triangle has three sides, we can see how, we, how that kind of works. We can sort of see it as the, by definition, triangles have three sides. It's somehow the properties are in the subject. Now, of course, as with all metaphors, it's, it's kind of mysterious. And that creates problems for a variety of reasons. Well, one is this. One division in philosophy traditionally has been between <coughs> the analytic philosophers and the uh, commentators. Not like continental breakfast, which is like, is that like, what's a continental breakfast? Like, I used to think it was free, but I found out it wasn't free. Oh, it was complimentary. Um, although I did, when I said continental, I was like eating it. I'm like, is it not free? It's like, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> On this continent. Yeah, so the continental philosophers are going to do with continental breakfast. But there was a division in philosophy of like continental philosophers like the French and so forth. Who do kind of a different kind of philosophy? No idea what they do. Can I explain to me? I'm still not going to do this. Analytic philosophy involves analysis. And so the tradition is analyzing the subjects for the French. So a claim might be we can analyze the subject of triangle and find contained within it three-sidedness. And then I do an analysis of that. And as you might imagine, People have been kind of skeptical, like, what is it to analyze the subject? I mean, we know what it is to analyze, say, you know, like a Twinkie or Bacon or something to see what's in it, but what would it be to analyze a subject, which is pretty mysterious. And some people say, yeah, we're analyzing stuff. But they'll say, what? what could that possibly be? I mean, I know what it is for my backpack to contain stuff, but I'm not sure what it is for a subject to contain a predicate. One way to look at it, which may be what Spinoza uh, Blavis is talking about, is that the predicates are contained in the subject like ingredients in a cereal. So you'd have you know, the subject, it would have a list of all the properties. And they're all in there somehow. And since I like cereal, I guess I'll accept the metaphor. It could be like frosted flakes or sugar pops or snacks or whatever sugar things there are. So get back on track a little better. What's he? claiming here. Well, he seems to be embracing what's called essentialism. And essentialism is this. To be an essentialist about properties is to claim that an individual, the subject, has all its properties, predicates, in such a way that changing the property would change the identity. 
Now, one of the subjects and debates in philosophy is that notion of essentialism. And again, the idea is basically a question of change. Now, if something's essential, it means that to something, means that if you were to move or change it, it would cease to be what it is. It would no longer be that. For example, with a triangle, it's essential to a triangle that it be three sided. If you take away the side, it's not a triangle, it's an angle, but not a triangle anymore. But it's not, it's not essential to a triangle to have a certain you know, coloration or size. So there's like essential and non essential properties. And so the idea is that essential qualities are such that if they were changed, it would no longer be what it is. And where it becomes kind of interesting is with you know, persons. What would be essential to you, such that if it was changed or altered, you would cease to be you? I mean, some things are kind of obvious, like you know, hair. You can cut your hair, and you're still you. <laughs> or you could you know, you know, get contacts or something and still be you. Now, Spinoza took the view that you know, everything is you know, God. But with Leibniz, his view is, sort of slides him into Leibniz, how so? Well, he claims this. He claims that the subject necessarily contains all its predicates. Going back to the list idea is this. So if you get a subject, let's say it can be anybody. Let's take uh, Donald Trump. And there'd be a list of all of all of that is Trump. All of Trump ingredients. Or you could use Bernie Sanders or anybody. So it'd be all, all of the things. Now Spinoza, again, believed in necessity. Everything has to be what it is, can't be otherwise, there's no contingency. But Leibniz claims there's some contingency. But Leibniz claims this, that Trump, using our example, necessarily contains all the Trump qualities. So that would include, for example, when he wins the election and becomes president in 2016. And then, you know, 50 years later, when his, his statue was added to Mount Rushmore as one of the greatest presidents. So it would all be in the, 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 Trump, the Trump predicates. Now, why is that Spinoza like? Well, this would seem to be a matter of you know, necessity. Because Trump, all that is Trump, from beginning to the end of Trump, is all in there. It can't be otherwise. So if Trump is the Trump predicate of winning the presidency in 2016, that was in there, so to speak, since day one. And if you could read the ingredients of the Trump, you would see that 2016, he's president. 2056, his face is carved in Mount Washington. In 2010, 2100, he's Saint, Saint Trump. So all that would be, be there. Nothing could be otherwise. So how does Leibniz reconcile <coughs> this apparent necessity with contingency? Well, he does kind of an odd thing. He ends up creating what's called a <laughs> contingent necessity. Now, that Trump will be president in 2016, not a tautology. Why? Well, Suppose you deny that Trump will not be president. Is that a contradiction? Uh, if you say Trump will not be president in 2016, is that a, is that a logical possibility? No. No. So, but if one of Trump's predicates is being president in 2016, he's got to be president. So, how does Leibniz reconcile the fact that we can say? But that, you know, it's not a contradiction to say Trump won't be president in 2016. But if Trump is going to be president in 2016, that it, it would be part of Trump's qualities. It, would, it, couldn't be any, it couldn't be otherwise. Because if he's Trump, then he's going to be president in 2016, if that's one of his, his qualities. Now, what Linus does is this. He creates something called contingent necessity, which sounds like a um, you know, political talk. But here's how it works. And they'll use an analogy to illustrate it. What he's saying is this. If you have any particular person, Trump, Sanders, um, 
anybody, all their list of ingredients, all, you know, as a line, you know, unforgiven, all they were, all they are, all they will be, is all in there. It's all in the, you know, that entity. But, this is where the contingency comes in, it's only if they exist that all that comes to pass. So, the contingency is, is that God could create Trump or no, or we could have created a different, different being, you know, another another type of Trump. But if he creates Trump, Trump has to be all this. But he didn't have to create Trump. So there could be a world without Trump. So no President Trump in 2016. But if Trump has that part of his Trumpness, then if God creates Trump, then that has to happen. But it doesn't have to, so it's contingent necessity. Now here's the crappy analogy. <laughs> you can imagine, bless you, that think of the of the world is like a game board. And you have like pieces you can pick to put on the board. Or like a video game. You can put in put in you know pieces in play. Uh, you can do like a Pokemon type of deal. You pick your whatever Pokemon you're gonna put in there. Now, God is kind of do you think kind of playing this game and the world is the board? And the idea is that he has these pieces he can play, but when he puts them on, he can put them on the board or not. But if he puts it on the board, it is what it is. So if you have like a particular, you're playing a particular game, you've got like a piece, whatever qualities the piece has, if the piece is in play, it's got those qualities. That's what the piece is. But if it's not in play, then it's not on the board. So we're kind of like those pieces. So the Trump piece, so to speak, has a list of all, you know, all of like the Trump stats. You know, God, of course, can see all those, so he knows what's going to happen. And so if God puts Trump into play, this is what, what happens. But contingent is that he didn't have to put Trump into play. And each of us have our own sort of list of ingredients, our own predicates. All that we, all, all that we were, all that we are, all that we shall be is in there. <clears throat> now, a good question to me is, so... <laughs> How do we not know? Well, this is what he claims. In the case of truths of fact, like Trump being president in 2016, we can't, we can't deduce the properties from the subject. For example, suppose you gaze at Trump and you analyze Trump. Would you find president 2016 in there like with a chemical analysis of Trump? You know, if we look at the subject Trump, we don't we don't see that being in there. We're we can not see that. So as Leibniz sees it, the reason why it seems contingent to us, and the reason why we don't know is because we lack the capacity to engage in that deduction. We can't infer that if Trump, then President 2016. But this is an epistemic problem. It's merely that we can't see the ingredients, so to speak. To use a, a crappy analogy, be like having a box of cereal, you can see like the, the cover, but you can't read the ingredients, or you don't know what the ingredients mean. So, what about God? Well, as Leibniz sees it, God can comprehend the infinite all at once. So, God knows the predicates of everything. So he knows, like, the case of Trump, all the Trump was, all the Trump is, all the Trump will be. Same for all of us. So, God is a prior knowledge of all contingent truths because he's, he's God. And so he can engage in that deductive reason. So a priori, prior to an experience, he knows. Now, this answers the question about God's omniscience. How does God know what's going to happen? Well, the answer is he can do the deduction. He knows he doesn't make Trump do stuff, but he knows that this is all the list of Trump ingredients, so he, he knows that. We don't. We lack the capacity to engage in this level of deduction, so we don't know. But if we did, we would be able to, to know that if we were, you know, mission like God, or so he claims. So, for example, 
um, God had a prior knowledge about how Alexander the Great would die. He has a prior knowledge about how each of us is going to die. He doesn't, you know, make that happen in a sense, but he knows it's going to, to occur. Here's another crappy analogy. If you think of each person as like a, a DVD with a film on it. Now, you can choose to play the film or not, but if you play the film, what's going to happen? Will it be a different outcome each time you play it? No, because once you've got the film, that's how it goes. So we think of each person as like the DVD. You know, you're the DVD. All the stuff in there is all the predicates. And so if you're put in the player, that's your, your movie. It's already you know, it's what you, you are. Now, so the difference between contingent truths and necessary truths for violence is this. There are some necessary truths that we we can sort of, that's within our capacity to figure out, so we recognize the assessment. Like triangles seven three sides, square seven four sides, etc. The contingent truths, and this becomes kind of lucky, because to be truly contingent, they have to be such that they could be true but don't have to be. But Leibniz seems to kind of smush in the epistemology of it, namely, there's like what we know and what we don't know. But he does kind of smuggle in contingency with that, you know, contingent necessity. That each you know thing has to be what it is, but God did not have to create that. He didn't have to create Trump. But once Trump is, then he has to be Trump. And all of these qualities are essential to us. So if any of these were different, even the slightest one, it wouldn't be Trump. And the same for me or me. So then how would you handle a problem like change? Like what if you get a, a haircut? Does that change your, your predicates? And the answer is, yeah and no. Yeah, in the sense that you, from our perspective, you've changed, you have a different haircut, but it's part of your predicate history. Your hair is this long at this time, and then this is you getting a haircut. So all the changes are built in there. So as we read about that, is everything sort of built in? If you could gaze upon your own ingredients, you would know your, your fate and your future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, in a way, he sort of rigs it because he says we, we can never tell because you know, we don't have, we're not, we're not gone. So really no way of proving right or, or wrong. That's one way to do philosophy. <laughs> now, this, um, this thing about contingency and necessity will, will show up in just a bit as well. OK, so the takeaway for Leibniz here is basically this. Like most thinkers, he does accept that distinction. Truths of reason, you know, tautologies that are true because of logical structure. Truths of fact, which are contingent. They, if they're true, they're true, but they don't have to be. They could be otherwise. And then he sort of gets things a bit, a bit mucky because he claims, you know, there are necessary truths that are just flat on necessary, triangles seven through sides, squares four sides. Then there are contingent truths about what you know could be and what not be. But then he seems to sort of smush those in in a weird way, namely that each thing is essentially what it is. It could not be any different from what it is. But the contingency is, is whether it's put into play or not. Again, going back to the analogy of the movie, you can play any movie you want, so to speak. But once you play the movie, the movie is the movie. It doesn't, the ending doesn't change. You play Star Wars, the, you know, the Death Star gets blown. You play the Yellow, all the other dies. Or you play old, old yellow, old yellow wars, old yellow blows up the Death Star. And he lives that that one. That's an even better movie, because he blows the Death Star and doesn't die. Great film. But then he goes to the dark side. So that's kind of bad. It becomes dark, dark yellow. <laughs> All lies. Okay, now we segue from dark yellow to his metaphysics, specifically God. 
Now, Mike may think is during this time, he is very obsessed with proving God's existence. And he has a variety of arguments. The first one is trying to prove God's existence by possibility and necessity. And this essentially is his version of the ontological argument. And it goes a little something like this. First, God is supposed to be a supreme substance. And what's a su supreme substance? I guess first, what's a substance? It's something. Yeah, something. Yeah, it's stuff. And a supreme substance would be yeah, more stuff. <laughs> With some maybe some what was it sour cream? Better, yeah, better stuff. Yeah, so it'd be, he'd be the greatest substance of all. With some bacon and sour cream on there, maybe a little guacamole on the side. God is also supposed to be, well, how many gods are there supposed to be? One. Yeah, just one. He's supposed to be universal and also necessary. And he claims that God is a, a pure consequence of possible being, incapable of limits and containing as much reality as possible. So God is limitless, not like the movie and the TV show, but truly limitless. And also he's as real as real can be. If you think of something real, God's realer than that. <laughs> He's the realest real for real. So how does this end up proving existence? Well, if God is absolutely perfect, not just perfect, but absolutely perfect, I guess like the odd guy, I suppose, then, now why is he absolutely perfect? Well, he has no limits, not even the limits of perfection. So he is uh, not just perfect, but absolutely perfect. Now, what about us? Are we perfect? No. Sadly, no. And he thinks that by necessity, we're imperfect. We can't be other than imperfect because our natures are limited by necessity. We not only are limited, but we cannot be otherwise. So then, how do we get to God. Well, it actually makes a pretty straightforward argument. First, he claims God is the source of the existence and essence of things as far as they are real. And without God, there would be nothing. Nothing existing, nothing possible. Now, why? Well, this is sort of the crux of the argument. He claims if there is a reality, to what he says, essences, eternal truths, etc. Or we can simplify, if there is stuff, if there is real stuff, there must be a necessary being in whom essence involves existence, or is sufficient to be possible in order to be actual. So what does that kind of swoosh down to? Well, basically what he's saying is, roughly put, if we have anything, we've got to have a necessary being. Why? Because if we didn't have a necessary being, we'd have nothing. But do we have nothing? Yeah. Well, we got something. So we have to have God. We have to have a necessary being. Now, why then must we exist? Well, one proof, of course, is we got stuff. So it's got to be God. But he brings up the following sort of interesting twist, which is this. He says, God alone must exist if he is possible. And it's kind of an interesting argument, which is this. Now, would most people agree that it's at least possible that God exists? It's not like a contradiction to say God exists. Yeah, even, even atheists would say, yeah, you know, God doesn't exist, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. And so here's this clever argument. If God could possibly exist, what could keep God from existing? Nothing. Nothing. Because he is, he has no limits, no negation, no contradiction. So if God could exist, then he does exist. And he could exist, so he, he does. So God has sort of interesting property that if he does exist, he does, of course. But if he could exist, he also exists. Because Nothing could keep him from existing. So, sort of an interesting approach. Not only does God exist if he does exist, he exists if he could exist. The only way it wouldn't exist is if it was impossible for him 
to exist, or so Leibniz claims. And so he thinks that is enough to establish God's existence. Now, is he right? Does that work? If God could exist, nothing could stop him from existing. So he's got it. It'd be like a movie, you know, movie trailer. They <laughs> thought they could stop God, and they were wrong. <laughs> That's Deadpool 2. They thought they could. It is. True story. God Deadpool, it's Marvel team up. You know, Deadpool the wisecracking, you know, killer. God, the less wisecracking guy. He's a straight, he plays a straight guy. I thought that was Kano. God's cool in Kano. <laughs> <laughs> he has all the superpowers. Of course, next time we're bored a movie, God's like, pow, we got this. Pow, we got this. <laughs> Let's go get some Nashua Supremes. <laughs> That's how it is. Spoiler alert. Yeah, does that work? Well, of course, one, one might object, well, <coughs> true, if, if God did exist, nothing would stop him from existing, but if he was just possible, he really wouldn't exist. So he wouldn't be there to be unstoppable. But it basically you know, requires working out like, how that would be. But it's an intriguing approach, that if he just could exist, it'd be enough for him to, to exist. So people who wanted to argue against that, if they bought that reasoning, we have shown not only that God doesn't exist, but that he, it wouldn't be possible. It would be impossible for him to exist uh, for a contradiction. So is that like saying a unicorn could exist and then a unicorn exists? Yeah, because if the unicorn was like you know, so badass that nothing could stop it, you know, <laughs> no one could stop it, he's unstoppable. <laughs> and then he would have, you know, he just, he just couldn't keep it from existing. Now, in the case of unicorn, you'd say, well, unicorns, you know, they're pretty, pretty impressive. They have some degree of badassery, but not as, you know, not to the degree of God. Something could stop them. Like a T-Rex, probably take a unicorn. <coughs> Except those little tiny, do you do a lot of bite? I guess they could use that, uh, what was the one in Jurassic World, the Invictus or something? Last one. Oh, there's, there's like the big one. They, they like lost oh, right mix with T-Rex. Uh, uh, Indominus? Yeah, Dominus. Yeah, I could probably take a unicorn. Deadpool 3. <laughs> Deadpool riding a unicorn versus, or Deadpool riding in the Indominus versus a unicorn. Written by, we'll say, Jessica Jones. I don't know, we've got to get across, get across, you know, so. Anyways, think about it, Marvel, think about it. <laughs> now, his next argument is the dreaded cosmological argument. Not to be confused with the cosmopolitan argument, which is one where on one argues after drinking a lot of cosmopolitans, which tends to be a lot of incoherent, you know, rambling. Now, cosmological arguments work kind of like this. Roughly put, well, the ontological argument is basically God's perfect, so he's always got to exist, because if he didn't exist, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he does. And the cosmological arguments, those are essentially, you know, creation arguments that in order, you know, God's got to exist because he created everything. We wouldn't have anything if there wasn't God. We got something, so there's got to be God. The third type of argument is called a uh, theological or design argument. Everything looks like, you know, things seem to be designed. No design without a designer. Only good design stuff would be God, so God's got to exist. And those are kind of the three stock arguments. Now, Leibniz's variation on the cosmological argument works like this. As we saw, he claims that there are two principles upon which our reasons are found, namely contradiction, which we know to always be false, and we know that denial of contradiction is always true. The second principle, which we haven't seen yet, is what he calls sufficient reason. And that is, well, this is what he calls, the, the contradiction one is pretty universally accepted. You know, because it's just a logical truth. Something can't be true, it can't be true. Now, sufficient reason works like this. He claims no fact can be real or existent, no statement true, unless there is a sufficient reason why it is so and not otherwise. So his claim is, is that in the case of necessary truths, they're always true because they're necessary. In a way, that's the reason. Why the truth of triangles have three sides? Because necessary truth. 
Now, anything else that's true, contingent truths, there always has to, according to him, there always has to be a reason why it's true rather than false. So everyone's you know, heard the you know, phrase, everything happens for a reason. And what he would say is everything happens for a sufficient reason. Now, sufficient in the context of logic means by itself it's enough to bring about the effect. A sufficient cause. And so he thinks that for any truth, a fact, since it could be true but could be false, there's got to be a reason why it's true. So he used the example of the you know, Super Bowl. The Panthers you know, lost, the Broncos won. So there has to be a reason why it's true the Broncos won. Or, you know, the expo markers on the desk, there's got to be a reason why. Now, is he right about that? Look at it in a general term. Does it make sense to say, yeah, there's, there's got to be a reason why something's true and not false? Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, sort of looked at kind of, I guess, informally, it does make sense. You know, if it's true, there's got to be some reason why it's true, true and not something else. <coughs> so then, there are these two types of truth. One, again, truth of reasoning, their opposite is impossible. And he thinks, going back to the stuff about analysis, he thinks that if you take a, a truth of you know, logic, truth of reasoning, he thinks you can analyze it and keep analyzing it back down to the simples and see the truth. And this ties back to his, you know, his view about mathematics. You know, namely, you can reduce all numbers to zeros and ones. And one thing that philosophers have been debating about for quite some time is what would it be to analyze something? You know, like I said, there's analytic philosophy, which is what we do in the West for the most part, uh, well, in America, in Britain. Then there's continental philosophy. And so the question is, what is that, you know, what is that analysis stuff? Now, the second type, sufficient reason again, are these are truths of fact. And he thinks that you always have to give a reason for it. Now, how does this prove God's existence? Well, here's what he does. He makes use of a regress and reductio. And basically what it is is this. Um, well, we can use, uh, I'll use an analogy to illustrate and then we'll go to the actual argument. Now, we've got, uh, suppose you take any person. Pick a person. Anyway. Shell bomb. Okay. You have Michelle Obama. Now, if Michelle Obama had to have parents. True? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she's got two parents. Now, do her parents have to have parents? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do their parents have to have parents? And do those parents have to have parents? Yeah, of course, this could go on for, for yeah, forever. But of course, it, it can't go forever because if it went forever, she wouldn't, wouldn't be here because it can't go back to infinity because you don't have an infinite amount of time for that to happen. So what he is what? Well, we need a first parent from which all everyone else came from. Because otherwise there would be, you know, no no Michelle Obama without tracing that back. No, you know, if there's no beginning, there's no now. And so we can infer if we're, you know, people who are religious thinkers would, would point would go back to, you know, God. People who are not religious thinkers would go back to well it it takes them back to evolution to some, you know, you know, first living creature. And then of course they trace them back to the the big bang, the origin of all things. And so yeah, to have Michelle Obama, we've got to have some beginning beginning point that is the cause of it all. Now Linus is a similar thing. He says that if you have a truth, pick a truth. A true kind. It is a truth, not, not like a logical one. Oh, logical truth. But but true. True but logical truth. We need a, a truth that's contingent truth. 
perhaps one about Kanye West. <laughs> Let's have a truth about Kanye. Kanye's the best song of song. Truth, tell the truth. <laughs> Kanye West is broke. Kanye is broke. Oh, yeah. There we go. And he could be good for like, you know, maybe not of all time, because then there's, there's a Kanye 2.0, which is an improved version of Kanye. <laughs> Super Kanye. Super Zayn Kanye. <laughs> but it's even better. Yeah, so Kanye is broke. He's asking for He's asking for money on, on the, the Twitter, which is pretty sad. <laughs> um, so we would need a reason for that. And one reason would be one. Well, how do you become broke? Yeah, if you compare with money, you spend a lot more than you bring in. So it becomes broke. And of course, we didn't, we'd have to trace back like each of the steps, like each of the, you know, what led him to be. Then you'd ask, like, why was he careless? And then you just say, well, if he was careless for a you know, because of pride, why does he have pride? And then if he has pride because of you know, a particular thing, the question of why that. Now, for every every question you can always ask, why? You know, why is he broke? Well, because he spent too much. Why did he spend too much? Pride. Why does he have pride? Well, because of this. Why that? Because of this. And of course, if we keep asking the questions forever, we get to know reason. It ends up, you know, that infinite regress. So what we need is we need a sufficient reason for which we cannot ask why. Because if we, if we ask why, we always need another, another reason. You know, like, like an annoying kid. Why, 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 why. So we need something where there's no why. It just is. Now, with a necessary truth, there's no why. It, it self-answers. You know, it just, it's a necessary truth. You know, problem solved. So what Leibniz needs is there must be a sufficient reason for everything. Something that answers the question, why? To everything. Now, Leibniz believes that if you trace any contingent truth back, be it Kanye being broke or whatever, it all goes back to a sufficient reason that requires no, you can't ask why. Well, you could ask why, but it would be self-answering, so to speak. And his answer to that is God. God is the reason for everything. So ultimately it all goes back to God, because we need something that is necessary, that cannot be otherwise, and this is, he says, what we call God. And it is the sufficient reason. Now, a critic might say, well, could we like trace it all back to like lots of stuff? You know, you have like you, tra you, you trace the Kanye is broke, you know, all the way back. It may end up, you know, one place. You know, I guess the God of being broke. I guess it was kind of hey now. Um, then you could have, you know, other explanations of other things, like why are why are cats purple? And you trace that back. And other truths. So you get all kinds of separate, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Well, Leibniz says that. There is but one God, and God suffices. So he seems to be doing kind of like an Occam's Razor argument. Occam was a guy, and he said uh, famously, do not multiply entities beyond necessity. Or put another way, keep it simple. The simpler explanation is better. So what Leibniz seems to be doing is saying, well, you can explain it all with one God. And one God suffices. In other words, you don't need more than, than one. So by economy, one God explains it all. So, if there is anything, then there is God, roughly. roughly there has to be something that answers the question, why everything? And the answer ultimately all goes back to God. So why is Kanye broke? God. God wants to be broke. <laughs> that, actually is pretty, that actually is a pretty good explanation. <laughs> And probably conclusive proof that God exists. I think that is that is the decisive argument, the Kanye West argument for Kanye is broke argument for God's existence. I think you'll revolutionize philosophy. And you were here for the moment. You will all be famous. We'll get the Nobel Prize in philosophy. I assume that's a thing. <laughs> probably not. Now, there is of course a bit of a problem here. Because, well, let's draw an analogy. 
suppose you're a you're a sleuth, the detective, an avenging hero, like Daredevil, um, the show Daredevil. And there's all these, you know, well, you, you, you've all seen like uh, the show, the crime shows where they have like the, uh, you know, they do like the flow chart thing, showing like all the bosses and stuff. And, and of course, there's like the mysterious, you know, kingpin in charge. And of course, the idea, if you if you want to take down the organization, what do you do? Yeah, you, you find you start off, you know, working your way up from the bottom, lead, getting leads to you get to the person to the top, the kingpin in charge. Because ultimately, the person responsible for all this happening is that, that kingpin. I mean, there's other people who are doing things, but they're doing it because, you know, you might have the, the person like the, you know, the junkie who stabs you a woman, but he does that because he's coerced by, you know, the heavy guy with the money. But the guy with the money does that because he's, you know, being coerced by some other guy who's heavier and he's got more money. And that ultimately traces back to the final guy. So, the person responsible, say, for the killing of the old lady, would ultimately be the, the boss. Now, this means, if we use that kind of reasoning, since God is the cause of everything, that means, on the cool side, he's a call, he's the cause of all the good stuff, like Kenya being broke. He's the cause of that. Thank you. <laughs> and he's you know, responsible for puppy dogs and rainbows and bacon. Delicious, delicious bacon. And parfaits and chocolate and rainbows, and all the nice stuff. A few of one's favorite things. But it also means he's responsible for all the bad stuff. You know, arteriosclerosis, Zika virus, the herpes, <laughs> bacon herpes. <laughs> it could be a thing. I'm not sure for that. Uh, genocide, everything bad. <clears throat> so all the good and all the bad come from God. <clears throat> Which leads to a classic problem. Which is, of course, the problem of evil. Which is this. How do we reconcile God being all good, all knowing, all powerful, with evil existing? And it's considered a very serious problem. Because if you want God to be all good, all powerful, all knowing, unless you just want to say, well, the hell of logic, you've got to come up with an answer. Now, Leibniz, of course, ends up with the, the problem pretty seriously because he makes God the sufficient reason for everything. Well, you know, any question you ask why, God is the kingpin. Everything traces back to God. I mean, the good stuff, like why are there, you know, why is there ice cream? God. Um, why do people have heart attack from eating too much ice cream? God. So all the good and all the bad. Now, interestingly, some religions don't have that problem. If you look at the Old Testament, God doesn't claim to be good. He says all things, you know, all good and all bad come from him. Old Testament God, no problem. There's no problem with evil for that. Uh, similarly, if you've got like, you know, a couple of gods, like in Zoroastrianism, you've got, uh, you know, the good God, the bad God, you know, equal, co-equal, then evil comes from the evil God, good comes from the good God. But if you have a single God that's supposed to be good and all powerful and all knowing, then the problem is how does bad stuff and there's actually an entire branch of uh, theology and philosophy devoted to this called uh, theodicy. Which is pretty cool. There's also uh, eschatology, which is the study of the end of the world, which is also pretty cool, cool too. Uh, you know, like for example, the revelations, the, the people that supposedly in the world ends. And so there's a study of that as, as well. I guess eschatology takes care of the Odyssey, because once the world's over, it's over. <laughs> so Leibniz has to address that problem, because ultimately, if we accept his cosmological argument, his argument for sufficient reason, God, that it would prove God exists, but it also makes God responsible for all the bad stuff. So how does he handle Well, one of the things that made Leibniz famous, in kind of an odd way, he said, this is the best of all possible worlds. Then a fellow named Voltaire came along and wrote a book called Candide, in which essentially it's a criticism of Leibniz. And in one of the ironies of history, Candide is probably way more famous than, than Leibniz. So kind of, kind of odd. 
it'd be kind of like a comedian, you know, who makes a career making fun of Donald Trump and ends up end up being way more famous. People are like, who's that Trump guy? This genius is making fun of type of thing. Or someone who makes a career on making fun of Bernie Sanders and becomes, you know, uh, real famous. We want to balance, you know, don't want to be be politically unbalanced here. Trump twenty sixteen. Live at Sarkham. And so what are the best of all possible worlds? Well, one of his famously claims, this is the best of all possible worlds. Now, one way to sort of say, where a person may be tempted to say, hey, that's BS, is to point out this. Think of like stuff that's happened to you. Does, if you take like a single event in your life, can you think of events in your life which could have gone better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone has that. It could be small things. Like, for example, um, you're making like a sandwich, and then like it falls out of your hand, and of course it's the, the part with the, yeah. you know, whatever you put on there, the mustard or whatever, that uh, lands face down. And you're like, oh, five second will. <laughs> <laughs> or you just toast it. You know, you're like, no heat, that's not a problem. <laughs> well, when you kind of think of it, like if you're eating like a meat sandwich, that was once, a, you know, inside an animal, so. It probably didn't get any growth than that. <laughs> that animal's probably roll around some awful stuff. Yeah, so we can think of you know many things, you know, small or big, where things could have gone better. Yeah, suppose you go, you head out to your car, and oh, this, this actually happened. There's whereas uh, last semester, uh, I was talking to um, Professor Owens, and he like looks out the window. And we saw like a tree, this chunk of tree just falls over and just crushes all these cars. Yeah. They're yeah. <laughs> like, that could have gone better for those, for those people. And I could tell he wasn't parked there because he was just like, sitting. He was like those poor bastards. <laughs> and so yeah, that, that could have gone a lot better for those for those people. I guess unless they had really, really good insurance and they all got you know, new cars. So Landis clearly can't say that every single thing that happens is the best thing that could happen. Because we could easily think of things that could be considerably better. So what he's claiming is this. If we take the entirety of the world from the beginning, if there is a beginning, to the end, the whole enchilada, the omniverse, then this world is better taken in totality than the others. So his claim is not that each thing that happens is the best possible thing. That you couldn't you know, conceive of something you know, better. But then if you take the world as a totality, this is the best world. And his view is, in terms of how this works, basically his view is this. He claims there's an infinity of possible universes, of possible worlds. And this is interesting in many ways because it's not like the first talk of possible worlds. But it is um, part of their development. Impossible worlds became interesting for a variety of reasons. One is, of course, uh, science fiction. You know, the idea of alternative universes. And there's a great deal of science fiction that involves you know, alternative histories, alternative stories, um, you know, tra traveling between possible worlds. So thank you, Leibniz, for all those good and bad stories about possible worlds. It's also, interestingly, uh, a serious theory in physics has been been for some time the idea that there are other other worlds you know parallel to our own parallel realities and they're not just like sci-fi style but for real uh, for example uh, one view is the way you reconcile our apparent choice with you know physics and determinism is that each thing that could be different branches off and creates like another world so there's a world like there are, there's like a world in which the Panthers won, and that, that world branches off from this world, and there's a world where the Broncos won, and then they just keep branching off, you know, there are separate, separate realities. And physicists say we got a math, so we should believe them, and other people say that seems pretty sketchy, but pretty cool, so we'll allow it, <laughs> as long as it's cool. But Lambda's view is this. He says when God was preparing to create the world, he had an infinite number of possible worlds to choose from. Now, being God, of course, he knows which of the worlds is the best of these worlds. 
So you can use an analogy to uh, a video game. It's kind of like um, when you're picking your, depending on the game, like if you're picking your character, you might have several characters to pick from, or if you can customize your character. Like you might have different, um, you know, appearances or different, you know, shaders for your armor or whatever. You're just kind of going through. And so you can imagine there's God, you know, with his Xbox God or PlayStation God sitting there with the controls. And he's got an infinite number of choices. So there's like the screen, there's all these worlds. You know, he's got the selector on them. And of course, since he's God, he knows, he knows which one of these is the best. So he doesn't have to go and read like, you know, Gamer, you know, Maximum PC or, or Gaming Times. He knows, he knows the best world. And what he does, of course, is since he knows which one is best, he picks the best because he's good. So his goodness requires him to pick the best world. So he doesn't pick like some crappy, you know, awful one, like with a bunch of zombies or something. He picks the best one because good. Now being all powerful, he can make that happen. So this is where him being all knowing, all powerful, and all good, you know, supposedly, you know, creates the good world. Which is, again, he's all knowing, so he knows what world is best. He doesn't pick like a, say, hey, that looks good. <laughs> I got all the zombies. And he also is, uh, you know, he knows it. He's all good, so he picks the best one. And he's all powerful, so he makes that happen. So there are all these other lesser worlds that God could, could have picked. But this is the best one of all. And that's, that's our world. We are in the best of all possible worlds, according to Leibniz. So unlike the you know, hypothesis in you know, physics or science, science fiction that there are other alternative worlds, for Leibniz, there's only one, namely the very best. Now, one could, could probably argue that maybe there are multiple bests, you know, that they're equally the best, but in different ways. You know, one's got, you know, say ice cream, but slightly different ice cream. Still really good, but slightly different in its flavor. And one world's got bacon, the other one's got like slightly different bacon, but still really awesome. And so maybe you could have, you know, many identical, identically awesome worlds, but different in their, their content, perhaps. But as he sees it, one world, and this is the best. So how does that solve the problem of evil? Well, it's the best world. It's not evil at all. <laughs> now, why then is it still not like perfect? Because when people read the problem of evil, one part of it is, well, we should expect a perfect world. Because God is all good, all powerful, knowing, so it should be perfect. Now, he uses an argument kind of similar to Spinoza's, which is this. God's perfect, of course. But could God create a perfect world? Well, no. Yeah, why not? Um, he couldn't because he would basically be making the world a piece of him or another guy. Yeah. Yeah, because if he made a perfect world, he'd be making, you know, God too. And so he would have to create another him. There would be, but it wouldn't be a world, it'd just be you know, God. So since, as Spinoza argued, you can't have two perfect beings, they'd be identical, and only God, you know, so only God can be perfect, we have to have a world that is less than God. So he thinks by biological necessity the world has to be imperfect. So his solution in a way is this. God creates the best world it can be, but it can't be a perfect world because it's logically impossible. Can't, can't do it. Now, of course, this creates a bit of a problem because God is supposed to be Omnipotent, which means what? You're all powerful. Yeah. All powerful. So one question is, you know, an important theological and philosophical question is, 
what is it to be all powerful? Now, one, and this actually became such a dispute, it broke down into two camps. I always wonder what these cards <laughs> that drive around. Drive and snack. That'd be a good time. <laughs> What'd you do today? I drove around and snack. <laughs> it was a good day in the office. Now, the two camps are the intellectuals and voluntarists. Now, they may seem to be like people who, you know, want to sit, sit around sipping lattes, talking about Proust and reading poetry. And the voluntarists, you may think, well, they're out, you know, helping out people. But it actually means different stuff. <laughs> intellectualists believe that God's intellect was well, dominant over his other attributes. So for the intellectuals, God being all-powerful means that God can do anything that is possible. He, his intellect, well, I guess put bluntly, limits what he can do. Because he won't do the impossible because being all-powerful means he can do anything that is possible. So God won't break the rules of logic. Everyone's probably heard the uh, uh, the question, you know, can God create a rock he cannot, cannot lift? And it was considered, you know, it's a question about God's power, because it seems to require that he do the impossible. Because if he creates a rock he can't lift, then he can't lift it, which means his power is limited. But if he can't create a rock he can't lift, then his power is also limited. Now, the correct answer, of course, is no, he can't create a rock he can't lift because he's so powerful that anything he creates, he can, he can lift. Stephen Colbert actually did a variation of that. Could, could uh, God create a yacht so big that he couldn't put, fill it with ladies? And the answer is no, because he can always create more ladies to fill the yacht. Interesting theological question. So if you're an you believe that God cannot do the impossible because his intellect tells him he can't, can't do that. So an omnipotent God on this view can do anything that is possible. So for example, he cannot create squares with five sides. Not squares that we call, you know, not five-sided figures we call squares, but four-sided figures with five sides. He can't create triangles with eight sides. Not octagons that we call triangles, but three-sided figures with eight sides, because that's impossible. Now, the voluntarists believe that God's will is his supreme attribute, that he can will anything, even the impossible. So for the voluntarist, God can make a triangle that has ten sides. Now, it's, again, it's not that we call a ten-sided figure a triangle, it's that the three-sided figure has ten sides. Now, we can make no sense of that because that is impossible to us. But if the volunteers are right, God can make that happen. You'd say, holy, it's a three-sided, ten-sided figure. And then you'd, you'd, probably, you'd probably have a stroke. So it's probably good enough to look at such things. That could be what happened to Tony. Maybe he gazed upon the ten-sided, three-sided figure, and he went broke. That's what happened to him. Could be. So has Bill Gates come through for him? Give him some money. Oh, Zuckerberg. He's asking Zuckerberg for some money. Oh, yeah. Did Mark come through? Uh, I don't think he wants to. He's not going to? He's not going to, not going to get help, out, help Kanye out? He's got a lot of money, though. He's got, he's got some billions. I guess he can make him work for Facebook. Oh, yeah. Maybe, like, handle everybody's status updates or something. He probably won't do it, though. Probably not. He <laughs> Poor Kanye. Mm -hmm. I guess he should have crossed, uh, did he cross Taylor Swift? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. that's, oh, that's Yep. That's a ditchy. Yeah. Yeah, you never cross Taylor Swift. <laughs> you never cross her. It's like you don't lie to Baskin Robbins, because Baskin Robbins always finds out, and you don't cross Taylor Swift. It's your own fault, Kanye. You shouldn't have crossed her. It took her a little while, but she got she got it. <laughs> so which camp does Lavitz fall into? Well, he's an intellectualist. He believes that God his intellect is 
dominant to his will, that he won't will the impossible. So this is how he solves the problem of evil, which basically works like this. He believes that there can be no better possible world because God's will is not independent of his intellect, not independent of the rules of logic. Now, the problem of evil as he sees it is this. Some people claim that God is not good because he knows the best. Let's say he's all-knowing. He can do it. He's all-powerful. But he doesn't do it. So he's bad. Maybe like someone who knows you're drowning, they can easily put, pick you out of the river, but they choose not to do so. They are not a nice person. Now, his reply is, a couple of replies are these. One is this. One is the um, sort of a stock reply, which is the big picture reply. But his other reply is kind of an interesting one. Now, the big picture reply is a very standard reply, which goes like this. When someone says, there's a problem of evil, you know, there's evil, there's trouble, etc., etc., the big picture reply is that, well, if you were to step back, and look at the big picture, you would see that the ultimate result is good. And they typically use um, a couple analogies. One approach, one analogy is kind of like, um, well, having a painting close to your face. If you take a beautiful painting and like stick your face in it, how beautiful does it look? Then it's like a blur of colors. But if you step back from it, you can see its beauty. Likewise, he thinks that, you know, there's one reply is, we're too close. So, but if we step back and look at the big picture in the long term, we'll see that it actually is good, that things work out. Another analogy that people often use, Leibniz doesn't use this, but it's you know, in the same vein, is kind of the, um, the parent analogy. Now, from the standpoint of the child, when they're going and getting, say, their vaccination against polio, is that a good experience? Yeah. No, I mean, it's painful. They're getting you know, hit with a needle. And so it seems awful. Like their parents are cruelly torturing them. But of course, from the standpoint of parents, you know better, they're actually doing something good for the, for the child. But from the child's you know, limited viewpoint, it's something bad. And so the idea is that if we had the, you know, the big picture <coughs> perspective, we'd realize that all the bad stuff is actually not that bad. And of course, there's also the view that things will work out in the, the end. It's all part of it. And that's a you know, very stark reply that pretty much everyone uses the problem of evil. Now, Linus does have kind of an intriguing reply, which is not so common, which is this. He says that we may find in the universe some things that are not pleasing to us, but it's not made for us alone. So here's reply is not, in this case, it's not, well, it's a big universe, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's not just your universe. So everything here is not going to be just for you. We I mean, can use an analogy. Think of like uh, when there is a, a meal for a, you know, a variety of people. Is a person going to like everything that's there? Now a person might say, what, what are these vegetables doing here? <laughs> they demand only meat. Or someone's a vegetarian, what's this meat doing here? Yeah, the things that they don't like, but it's not just the meal is not just for them. And so it's kind of an intriguing reply that in order for you know other you know people to have what they like, that means there'll be some things we don't like. So we can go and go with a simple example of like meal. Vegetarian doesn't like the meat, but the person who likes bacon, bacon has to be there for for them. So the universe is not just for us. So the whole thing won't be pleasing to us, which is a pretty clever and interesting reply. Now. Does that work? Is that convincing? Well, for the first one to be convincing, we'd have to accept that our, you know, our suffering is always for, if we go with a parent analogy, that our suffering is always for a reason. That if, um, you know, you take like, the most horrible example you can think of, that someone's, you know, some small child is grabbed, chained up, and gutted like a fish. 
and you have to say, well, that, that's going to make them a better person. Mm -hmm. Oops, they're kind of dead. <laughs> um, or maybe it makes other people better. Or if you go with a big picture view, you have to accept that it all works out in the end. So you have to see, like, have faith that it will all work out. But then you may wonder, well, why do you have to go through all that suffering to get to the good, good end? Now, we know that with limited stuff, you know, for example, if you want to do well in a marathon, you get to suffer all that, you know, that running. But you may wonder, like, why does God have to put people through all, like, genocide? Think of, like, all the genocides, the murders, the wars, the disease. Why do we have to go through all that to get to the good end? Why don't we just go right to the, to the good? And so it does remain a bit of a, a challenge, which is why the problem is still a problem. So we'll put it into this particular evil. And next time, more evil. So think about evil stuff, but do good stuff. And remember, when things are going bad, remember this is the best of all possible worlds. So if you get a ticket on your car when you go get it, don't feel bad. Just tell yourself this is the best of all possible worlds.